Sing the symphony My heart beats when it could not sing a P One G play some keys to sing for me I get hooked to the chorus guaranteed uh, I'm a tempo tempo Music takes you to the place it came from Instrumentals in your mental echoes In your subconscious it sits and set those Catch Amazing Minds Mondays, Wednesdays and Fridays, 20 hours Central African time on YouTube, Google, Apple and Spotify for podcasters. Zambia's first late night show. You're welcome to Bible Talks. Fridays are for Bible Talks. I hope you brought your shouting clothes tonight. If you're not subscribed, please do subscribe. Hit that bell and share. It's always a privilege to be here with you to share the Word of God with you every Friday. And you may be aware we're doing a, a series right now um, that we have titled The Personality of God series. And within that series, we began another series, a sub-series within uh, the main series, which is God is Strong. And today we're doing part two of God is Strong, which is hopefully the last part of this particular segment under the Personality of God series. This will be, I believe, part four of uh, the series, part three or part four of the series, part three, right? Yeah. And uh, it's been a privilege to share what I've shared with you so far. I'm excited to share what we have today uh, under this subject of God being strong. It's important to keep your curiosity about God alive, to keep your knowledge, your understanding of godly things ever growing, ever deepening. The Bible says, deep calleth unto deep. Just a couple of days ago, I was traveling from one city to the other, and we had very interesting conversations with uh, the colleagues I was with in the vehicle. And one of the points that one of them brought up was how that God is not to be studied, God is not to be searched out, that what he has given us, that the secret things are for the Lord and what he has revealed are for you and your children. There's a scripture that actually says that, right? Yet my rebuttal to that comment was that the Bible also does say that those that seek him will find him. He that comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those that diligently seek him. If you have already found something, then there is no need to seek it. What that means is that when you find God, there is still more to seek. God is unsearchable, yet searchable. You can't exhaust him, but you can keep growing in him. He's the source of all things. 
for you to fully understand God, you would have had to first go through the 8 billion people that are on earth presently. And then you'd have to go through the 110 billion people that died before. And then from there, you have to go into the heavenly worlds where you study the angelic races. And you finally get to the ultimate heaven where God is. And you begin to study certain aspects of God uh, within that place. What I'm trying to say is that every single being and thing that has come out of God carries an attribute of God that can tell you something about God. No wonder the book of Romans tells us that God is evident through nature and that we are inexcusable uh, as it pertains to whether we understood that indeed God was there. And so the Bible in the book of Romans further goes on to tell us that they have worshipped the creature rather than the creator because we have failed to derive lessons from all we see, lessons that point to God. Rather, we have focused on what we are seeing and it's important to know that if you are a Christian, then not only do you hear from God, but you hear by the God that is in you, which means you should be able to interpret things about God in situations, in things, in events, in places. All that should speak to you about God because God is in all these things. So God is searchable, yet unsearchable. And today we are looking at certain elements, certain aspects of God within this study of the personality of God. Who exactly is God? What has he revealed to us about himself? What can we search through the scriptures to be able to discover things we did not know about God? Do not get comfortable with what you have been told, what you have studied so far, what you know, because there is much more to know. Here's my question. What do you suppose life will be like in the world to come after that everything every prophecy has been fulfilled everything has come to pass jesus says heaven and earth will pass away but my words will remain so after everything after heaven and earth have passed away and you and i being in his word remain what do you suppose life will be like that will be in one big white room called heaven raising our hands for eternity, worshiping God? Is that what you suppose life will be like? When we get to what we say, heaven. Because many people have been made to believe that the final destination after here is heaven. That once salvation occurs here, all we have to do is sit down and wait. I'm afraid to... Uh, tell you otherwise, that is not what life will be like in those days. As a matter of fact, life will be way more eventful, seeing as we will no longer be working for food. So you can imagine the level of progression that the world will go through, knowing that everyone has something to eat. Everyone has a place to stay. No one is working for food, clothing, or accommodation. It shows you that the fabric, the quality of life will be different. What life will mean will be entirely different. And so it's important that you begin to learn certain aspects now in order for you to be ahead in the life to come. You see, what you know now will put you ahead or behind in the life to come. Jesus talked about how those that are small now will be great then and those that are great now will be small then. And of course, he's talking about the, the flip side of it how things will not be as they are now. And to be honest with you, there's a reason why there'll be a place for small people and big people in that world, because some would have put in the work in this world that would put them ahead in that world. I hope, I hope I'm making sense. So today in studying the personality of God and the strength of God, we uh, set up a good foundation last week, what I believe to be a good foundation. Um, talking about how God has created worlds and he does not eventually need to stand up from his throne to have anything achieved unless he so desires to. But 
everything that God could think of doing, he has created provision. A person, a being, a thing to be able to accomplish that thing. And this is why God does not need to get up from his throne because for anything he needs to do, there is a creation that has been uh, established for that. So today we are going to look at God putting this, his strength into use. We're going to look at a couple of scriptures from the book of Genesis. I'll read you some lengthy passages, but we'll not look at too many scriptures because I gave you a lot of scriptures last week. And I will not take too much of your time today. Uh, rather, I'll explain to you what is necessary for you to know in this particular segment and not try to, and, and try not to digress much. So let's start with the first scripture that we're going to read through from the book of Genesis. Chapter 18, we'll read from verse 1 all the way to 8. Hope you brought your shout and clothes tonight. All right, let's go. Then the Lord appeared to him by the terebinth trees of Mamre, as he was sitting in the tent door in the heat of the day. So he lifted his eyes and looked, and beheld three men were standing by him. And when he saw them, he ran from the tent door to meet them, and bowed himself to the ground, and said, My Lord, if I have, found, if I have now found favor in your sight, do not pass on by your servant. Please let a little water be brought and wash your feet and rest yourselves under the tree and I will bring a morsel of bread that you may refresh your hearts. After that, you, after that you may pass by in as much as you have come to your servant. They said, do as you have said. So Abraham rushed. So Abraham hurried into the tent to Sarah and said, quickly make ready three measures of fine meal, knead it and make cakes. And Abraham ran to the herd took a tender and good calf, gave it to the young man, and hastened to prepare it. So he took butter and milk and the calf which he had prepared and set it before them. And he stood by them under the tree as they ate. Now, there's been a debate recently in Christendom, I believe, concerning whether God can eat uh, physical food <laughs> There's a lot of scriptures that show us um, scenarios like this where the Lord and his angels partook in food. I remember Moses and the 72 elders eating with the Lord as he stood upon a firmament. And so I will not get into that today, but yeah, this is what happened. The Lord appeared to Abraham with two angels and Abraham welcomed them. He discerned and was able to recognize these are not ordinary men. And so he welcomed them and prepared some food for them, a calf, um, some bread, some butter and milk. And they sat and ate and enjoyed themselves. I'm moving forward. Then they said to him, where is Sarah, your wife? So he said, here in the tent. And he said, I will certainly return to you according to the time of life. And behold, Sarah, your wife, will have a son. Sarah was listening in the tent door which was behind him. Now Abraham and Sarah were old, well advanced in age, and Sarah had passed the age of childbearing. Therefore Sarah laughed within herself, saying, After I have grown old, shall I have pleasure, my Lord being so old, being old also? And the Lord said to Abraham, Why did Sarah laugh, saying, Surely, saying, shall I surely bear a child since I am old? Is there anything too hard for the Lord? At appointed time, I will return to you according to the time of life, and Sarah shall have a son. But Sarah denied it, saying, I did not laugh, for she was afraid. And he said, no, but you did laugh. Now, this scripture is interesting to me because it reveals something here about God to begin with. Sarah laughed within herself, but God heard it. This tells us what God is able to hear. He's able to hear beyond what has been vocalized. God knows what is inside the hearts of every man. 
So God was able to hear when Sarah laughed, even though she did not laugh out loud. She laughed within herself to the extent that when he said, why did you laugh? She got afraid and said, no, I did not laugh. And he said, no, but you did laugh. <laughs> so the Lord is able to hear even what has not been spoken. This also uh, shows us God's omniscience, that God does not need to be told in order to know. But I'm going somewhere. All right, so we know after that, um, we'll read from, from verse 16 going forward. Let's go. Then the men rose from there and looked towards Sodom, and Abraham went with them to send them on the way. And the Lord said, Shall I hide from Abraham what I am doing? Since Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation, and all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him. For I have known him in order that he may command his children and his household after him, that they keep the way of the Lord to do righteousness and justice, that the Lord may bring to Abraham what he has spoken to him. And the Lord said, because the outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah is great. I want you to take note of this. Because the outcry of Sodom and Gomorrah is great, and because their sin is very grave, I will go down now and see whether they have done altogether according to the outcry against it that has come to me. And if not, I will know. Now, Abraham here is talking to God. The two men that were with the Lord have proceeded, have gone towards Sodom. They looked towards Sodom and they actually proceeded towards Sodom. And I'll show you why I say so. And Abraham remains uh, talking with the Lord and the Lord reveals to him saying, I want to go and investigate whether the outcry uh, towards Sodom has come to me. Now, a couple of things here that you need to take note of. There is an outcry. There were people that were crying about Sodom because Sodom did something to them. And so they cried and the cry reached the ears of the Lord. And the Lord came down to verify. This is the same Lord who was able to hear Sarah laugh without speaking. But the Lord this time came down to verify. Is this outcry really true? Now, later on, you see that after the Lord finished talking with Abraham. He proceeded and went, but the angels had already gone before him. I would like to believe that the Lord stood somewhere afar watching what was happening. Now let's, let's skip on to verse, to chapter 19, because going forward, Abraham begins to negotiate with the Lord. What if you find 50? What if you find 30? What if you find 10? And the Lord said, if I find 10, I will not destroy it for the sake of the 10. And he did not find the 10. He found Lot. And we know what happened with Lot. Now, chapter 19, verse 1. Now the two angels came to Sodom in the evening, and Lot was sitting in the gate of Sodom. When Lot saw them, he rose up to meet them, and he bowed himself with his face toward the ground. And he said, Hear now, my lords, please turn into your servant's house and spend the night and wash your feet then you may rise early and go on your way. And they said, no, but we will spend the night in the open square. But he insisted strongly. So they turned into him and entered his house. Then he made them a feast and baked unleavened bread and they ate. Now before they lay down, the men of the city, the men of Sodom, both old and young, all the people from every quarter surrounded the house. And they called to Lot and said to him, where are the men who came to you tonight? Bring them out to us that we may know them carnally. So Lot went out. So Lot went out to them through the doorway, shut the door behind him, and said, Please, my brethren, do not do so wickedly. See now, I have two daughters who have not known a man. Please let me bring them out to you, and you may do to them as you wish. Only do nothing to these men. Since this is the reason they have come under the shadow of my roof. Now, Lot here sees the angels. Again, he is discerning because he's been with Abraham. So he recognizes these are not men, these are angels. And he invites them into his house uh, for them to come and not only 
have shelter but have a meal and he prepares a feast for them and unleavened bread. Now the interesting thing is that the angels at first refuse to go into Lot's house and say we will spend a night in the open square. This to me shows me what the people of Sodom may have done to those people who cried out to the Lord because the angels deliberately wanted to sleep in the open square so that the men of Sodom may attempt to rape them. They wanted to sleep in the most exposed place so they give no reason for ambiguity. But Lot insisted. They went into his house and the men of Sodom still did not withhold themselves. And therefore the Lord at this point confirmed the cry that had reached his ear. Now the reason I bring this up is because firstly, God said, I will go and confirm if indeed the outcry that has come to me is true. Yet the one who went was not God. It was two angels. Two angels went to confirm, yet God remained negotiating with Abraham. And I believe when the Lord passed Abraham, he watched from afar, probably. Or maybe he returned to heaven. But what we do know is that the Lord himself did not go to Sodom. It was the two angels that went to Sodom. This is God extending himself because God is strong. So God is able to accomplish this verification task without having to verify himself. Now, I mentioned to you that it was important to know that God is omniscient, even though this scripture here tells us that God needs to verify. This to me is important because when God said, let man have dominion over the earth, he suddenly excluded himself from that. Is it because God cannot have dominion over the earth? Of course not. If God wanted to have dominion over the earth, he will. As a matter of fact, he will establish a kingdom in the earth. One day, this earth will officially become a member of the kingdom of God. And the rules of God that govern his realm will begin to govern this realm. Yet when God establishes a channel, a procedure, a task for an individual, he separates himself. God is not threatened by anyone. Therefore, he does, not, he does not want to threaten anyone by stepping into their lane. So he allows the angels to do their work and he allows humans to do their work, not because he is not able to, but because he is strong. And therefore, God is able to achieve tasks not only through the angels, but through you and I. Are you a resource unto the Lord? Is God able to hear because you are present in a place? Is God able to see because you are present to a place? Ladies and gentlemen, God is not silent as men accuse if we are listening. And many people have come into this kingdom of God believing that we have come into a kingdom where we are not allowed to ask questions. And for some of you, the reason why is because you have not learned how to extract answers from God for the questions you have. I hope you watch on in this personality of God series, and I'll sure be able to help you learn how to extract communications from the Lord and how to become a member of God's host to be able to be resourceful to the Lord. As I said earlier, I will not keep you long, and it's been a pleasure being here. See you in the next one. Hey, like what you see? I know you do. Hit the button below to subscribe and don't forget to hit the notification bell. Ciao.